Welcome to the third video in this series on the top 10 vampires of the clans of Vampire the Masquerade. This video will discuss 10 of the most notable members of Clan Gangrel, the Beast Clan. If you were a wrestling fan back in the late 90s, you might remember a WWF, WWE, app, eh, whatever, a guy on your TV calling himself Gangrel. That gimmick was licensed to WWF by White Wolf, though I doubt any proper Gangrel would be caught dead, or deader rather, in a shirt with ruffles on it. For all of the bourgeois tendency to rail against the system, it is the Gangrel who are most likely to be autarkous, free of any duties or loyalties to sects or even clans. And without further ado, here are the top 10 vampires of Clan Gangrel. Number 10, Enkidu. Let's kick off this Gangrel list with a big, bad Gangrel. The only Gangrel on the Camarilla's Red List, which is their version of the FBI's 10 Most Wanted list. The name of that Gangrel is Enkidu, a child of the Gangrel Antediluvian. When he was mortal, Enkidu was a lowly shepherd in a village outside of Ur of the Chaldees, the birthplace of the biblical patriarch Abraham. Enkidu looked to the great ziggurat of Ur, built to honor the moon goddess Nana, patron deity of the city. Enkidu could see the ziggurat from his village. By night, he thought he saw figures moving atop the ziggurat and heard strange music coming from within. In his dreams, he saw a woman's lips approaching his as if to kiss. But those lips parted to reveal fangs that would hover just above his throat. When he awoke, he swore that he could see things standing atop the ziggurat, staring at him. The dreams drove him into the city of Ur. There he was surrounded by the excesses of humanity, of sacrifices of animals to a god who refused to answer. Surrounded by human wickedness and divine disdain, he grew to hate humanity and the god who tormented his dreams. His only comfort was in the company of animals, innocent of ambition and lust, unlike humans. And he grieved deeply as those animals were led away to slaughter, their blood offered to the moon goddess. When he walked the streets of Ur, he would come upon the handmaidens of the gods, women with pale skin, flawless faces, and talons like birds of prey. One night, he came upon them in a torch-lit alley, basking in the degradations and revels of the city. They turned, chattered amongst themselves in a language he could not understand, and pointed at Enkidu, nodding in agreement as if to say Enkidu would make an acceptable sacrifice to their god, selecting him in the same way that the temple priests selected animals for the altar. Enkidu swore at the creatures, but they answered his anger with laughter. His rage burned so hot in him that he thought he would explode. He would not suffer another night of torment. He would discover the secrets of his dreams and the mystery of the bloody moon goddess or die in the attempt. As the sun stood high the next day, Enkidu resolved himself that he would die. With a stolen sword, he cut his way past the ziggurat's guards and mounted the wall. His fingers clung to the brick as spears whistled past him. A crowd gathered to watch the poor, doomed idiot who dared to provoke a god's wrath. Enkidu reached the zenith of the heavenly mountain at dusk. He saw a temple there, the place where destiny awaited him. He threw down the sword, knowing that it would be useless against whatever he was about to face. As he entered, he saw the three creatures, the three women, waiting for him. Rather than tear him to shreds, the gangrel trio led him into the temple, redolent with the scents of blood and animals, smells that were strangely pleasing to Enkidu. As he was ushered into the presence of the god, the gangrel antediluvian, its weary eyes assessed him, measured him. It looked to its servants and nodded its approval as they withdrew. Enkidu fell to his knees of his own volition and awaited the god to end him and the dreams that had haunted him for so long. When he regained consciousness, his life had been taken, but it was replaced by new, dark strength from the god herself. The trio of Gangrel took him out from the temple and under the stars. They explained to him that the antediluvian labored to contain a creature within its flesh, the last of its kind, the Typhonian beast. The Typhonian beast, in addition to being the last of its kind, was a ghoul of the antediluvian Set, the god of the followers of Set, twisted by blood and magic to be destructive and blood-hungry. They explained that Enkidu's dreams were that he had been chosen by the Antediluvian as the keeper of not just the Typhonian beast, but of all the other extinct creatures that the Antediluvian housed within its body. 
Enkidu remained with his sire for a century, training to control and harness the beast until the Setites and their allies laid siege to the city. The Gangrel were beaten back as Ur burned down around them. Enkidu saw in the Setites everything he hated about humanity, the excess, the vice, the violence. His fury exploded and he transformed into a true monster. Enkidu tore his way through the Setites and escaped into the night. Since the fall of Ur, Enkidu has wandered the world as the keeper of rare animal ghouls, often the last of their kind, within his monstrous flesh. More importantly, he is the jailer of the Typhonian beast, which he keeps starved of blood in order to better control. Many times he has considered killing the beast, but his compassion stays his hand. Enkidu chooses to believe that if he purged the followers of Set, then the Typhonian beast would be free of the Setite's darkness. He either does not understand, or chooses not to understand, the inherent malice in the beast, its loyalty to its creator Set. The Typhonian beast wants to be found, and wants to be freed of Enkidu, and to return to its master's side. To that end, the beast uses its Auspex powers to telepathically summon any nearby Setites to free it. Over the centuries, Enkidu has learned that he needs his humanity in order to resist the Typhonian beast. To that end, he has used his powers to effectively split himself into two identities, Enkidu, the Noah, and Sabrina, the vessel of his humanity. As Enkidu, he is the greatest predator on Earth. His body is massive and ever-shifting, containing the ghouled beasts in his care. As Sabrina, he appears to be a young girl with black hair and green-blue eyes. Sabrina comes to the forefront when Enkidu needs to hunt for kindred blood in the cities, or to scout for Setites that he will eventually destroy. Oh, I did say kindred blood, didn't I? Might as well disclose how Enkidu ended up on the red list. Enkidu does not use his own blood to ghoul the beasts in his care, except for the Typhonian beast. For his menagerie, Enkidu uses the blood of other kindred to maintain his animal's immortality. But what about the blood bond, you ask? Well, it's impossible to be blood bonded to a vampire that's already been destroyed. The Gangrel lobbied hard to put Enkidu on the red list, and argued that he should take a higher position on the list, but they were reluctant to disclose to the rest of the Camarilla exactly why. Some Gangrel only see Enkidu as a monster that too frequently preys on their clan. Others who have managed to observe him covet the ancient beast within his flesh. Number 9 Odin, the All High. In the grand tradition of vampires taking on the mantle of divinity, allow me to introduce the Gangrel Methuselah, Odin, the All High, or Votan, if you prefer. His mortal life is almost completely unknown, but given his generation, he has but one possible sire, the Gangrel Antediluvian, making Odin a blood brother to Enkidu. Yet Odin, the All High, has more of an interest in civilization than Enkidu. Odin's first appearance was as a priest to several Germanic tribes. It occasionally pleased Odin to direct the tribes to war with Rome, but when he tired of them, he moved north to Scandinavia, where the people worshipped him as the god, Odin. He made his haven in Uppsala, which still exists today in Sweden. A certain group did not appreciate Odin's efforts to take control of the Swedes, the lupine tribe known as the Get of Fenris. It's interesting that in Fenrir lore, they hold that their greatest enemy is also named Odin, attributing various malicious and treacherous deeds to him. Same person, maybe. In response, Odin traveled across Scandinavia, embracing a brood to help him fight against the Lupines, some of whom would become the Valkyrie, or the Valkyries, a coterie who brought brave mortals to his hall at Uppsala to join the Einherjar, his warriors of Ragnarok, who went into battle against the Geta Fenris. Another reason for the conflict between Odin and the Lupines was that Odin's temple at Uppsala was built on top of a cairn, a place of spiritual power that the Lupines coveted. Odin kept his brood's bloodthirst in check and his Einherjar ghouled to him through the use of an artifact called the Bloodhorn. This magical object could, with a drop of Vampire Vitae, transmute any ale or mead inside of the horn into an equal amount of the same Vitae. This was handy for maintaining the Einherjar and Odin's brood from depopulating the region. Odin's rule came to an end with the entry of Christianity into Scandinavia. In 1087 AD, mortals, armed with steel, 
fire and true faith drove Odin and his brood from Uppsala and set fire to his temple. As his followers were either slain or fled, the All High disappeared, taking Scandinavian paganism and his blood horn with him. Number 8. Brunhild. The leader of Odin's Valkyries, Brunhild, remembers almost none of her mortal life, save that she was the daughter of a Viking chieftain at one time. All she remembers is that long ago she was embraced by a sire she never met, and was left to stalk her homeland hungry for blood. After a time, she met other Gangrel who instructed her in their ways. These Gangrel, all female, called themselves Valkyries, those who choose the slain. Those they killed in battle went on to Valhalla. For several centuries, Brunhild rode with the Valkyries, slaying scores of men, but carrying others to Uppsala to become ghouls in Odin's living Einherjar. But the Vikings took Christian slaves from England, Ireland, and France. This was to be their downfall. It gave way to Christian missionaries, and as chapels and churches rose, shrines and groves were abandoned. The kings of Europe, and their Ventru and Toreador masters assimilated the Scandinavians to the rule of kings and the primacy of the church. The Valkyries chose to drive the Christians out of their land and return the rule of Jarls and pagan gods. The vampires of clan Ventru, Toreador, and even Bruja hunted the Valkyries down, bleeding their strength one vampire at a time. Those who did not meet final death found secret places to go into torpor. After fighting for two centuries, Brunhild also found such a place in the wastelands of Scandinavia and slept away the ages. But the guns and bombs of World War I roused Brunhild from her slumber. Needless to say, she found the world greatly changed compared to when she had gone into torpor, and what she saw greatly displeased her. While the kindred of Europe concerned themselves with the war to end all wars, hint, it wasn't, Brunhild quietly traveled seeking her remaining sisters and reunited them beneath her banner. They resolved to return Scandinavia to the rule of the Einherjar and the knights of glorious pagan bloodshed that was their destiny as Valkyries. Following World War II, Scandinavia has been a hotbed of anarch activity, thanks in no small part to Brunhild and the Valkyries. She has no love for the anarchs and simply regards them as useful tools for tearing down and undermining the Ventru and Toreador who invaded her homeland. Meanwhile, the Scandinavian Camarilla does everything it can to conceal Brunhilde's activities and their inability to deal with her. In 1977, a report from the Camarilla leaked back into Brunhilde's hands that a coterie had discovered a pack of werewolves, dead and completely drained of their blood. She suspected that her grandsire, Odin the All High, had risen. When she reached his resting place, the ice cairn that had surrounded his body for centuries was melted, and the All High had drops of fresh blood in his beard. Since then, Brunhild has moved her haven into the cave of Odin to watch over the sleeping Methuselah. Rumor has it that the assassin responsible for the murder of Prime Minister Olaf Palm in 1986 bore a strange resemblance to Brunhild, though what she would hope to accomplish by such a murder is a mystery. Perhaps she wanted to be seen and upset the Scandinavian Camarilla, Perhaps Odin himself moved her to advance some arcane scheme of his. Prior to the fall of the Anarch Free States, Brunhild dispatched four of her sisters there in the interest of recruiting Anarchs to the ranks of the Einherjar and new members to the Valkyries. Number 7. Arnulf. Vampires are often described as creatures of the city, predators trapped in a gilded cage. Not so with Arnulf a gangrel whose campaign of destruction against cities and civilizations is so legendary that he is still spoken of by gangrel centuries after his demise. Arnulf began as a simple warrior in the army of the Goths in the 5th century, whose whole world consisted of eating, sleeping, fucking, and killing. Why the gangrel Methuselah Pard gave him the embrace he never discovered or understood, but Arnulf regarded his newfound immortality as a blessing. He disappeared into the plains and forests of the northern Balkans, living as befit a king of beasts, slaughtering all who dared to encroach on his territory. His life as a vampire was little different than his life as a mortal. He slept, hunted, drank blood, created progeny, slept again. Arnulf was a prolific sire to the point of recklessness. 
most of the Balkan Gangrel can claim descent from Arnulf. Arnulf's immediate progeny respected their sire, for they were like him and coveted their freedom, despite having little love for one another as they squabbled over territory. Arnulf tolerated the primitive tribes that wandered between the Danube and the Volga, though it was much the same tolerance as a bear has for a deer when the bear isn't particularly hungry. Despite his bestial preference, Arnulf occasionally integrated himself into some tribe for a time, if only to amuse himself. The Lupines of Eastern Europe, the Shadow Lords, despised Arnulf, who preyed on their kinfolk himself or sent some of his tribes down to crush the kinfolk. Arnulf was so savage that he managed to drive the Shadow Lords into the Carpathian Mountains rather than continue to fight him. Yes, a gangrel was such a badass that a bunch of Lupines said, nope, and got the fuck out of his territory. Arnulf was then beset by a new problem, civilization. He looked on the neatly plowed fields and crude walls of towns and villages, and his wrath was stoked. These mortals defied natural order, the struggle between predator and prey, and needed to be punished for their temerity. Arnulf roused many of his children and grandchildren and their mortal allies to lay siege to the towns and villages, to burn their crops, carry off their women and children as slaves. The Byzantines, the Bulgarians, the Croats, the Serbs, the Magyars, Arnulf either destroyed them or he stamped them down and pulled them up, burning the weed of civilization wherever he could. He owed allegiance to none but himself and even used the Huns to destroy Rome, facilitated the Turks to war against Constantinople, and the Mongols to devastate Hungary and Poland. When other vampires, even other gangrels, stood against him, he killed them without mercy. However, despite his godlike power, he was still but one vampire, standing against the tide of human will and vampiric manipulation. In 1512 AD, his temporary alliance with the Turks brought him into conflict with the Principality of Wallachia and its prince, Dracula, of Clan Zamitzi. Though Dracula was new to the blood, having been embraced a mere 17 years earlier compared to Arnulf's millennium of unlife, Dracula met Arnulf in single combat and cut the ancient Gangrel down, along with his primitive way of life. In the modern nights, Dracula still regards the barbaric Arnulf as a fearless enemy worthy of his rare respect. To the Gangrel, and especially those who walk the path of the beast, Arnulf is venerated as a legend, a hero, and a martyr. Number 6. Javier de Calais One of the most famous, or infamous, Gangrel in the modern nights is the former Camarilla Justicar for Clan Gangrel, Javier de Calais, second child of Rune of Tentagel. Javier was born in the 14th century in Loire, France. When he reached adulthood, he was conscripted by the English as a yeoman to fight in the Hundred Years' War, which spanned the rule of five different kings on both the French and English sides. Most people's teachers probably turned them off to history, but the Hundred Years' War is incredibly fascinating, as it was the conflict that closed the curtain on medieval feudal warfare and planted the seed for the professional standing armies of later in Europe. Anyway, Javier rose through the ranks until he became a sergeant. His last battle as a mortal was at Poitiers in September 19, 1356, where he participated in the capture of the French king, John II, or John the Good. Javier was rewarded that evening with a knighthood from James Lord Audley and lands off the coast of France. But Javier had another visitor and another reward from Rune of Tentagel, posing as a wandering minstrel who embraced him into Clan Gangrel, and in keeping with the <clears throat> honored tradition of abandoning one's progeny, disappeared without so much as a daddy's going out for a pack of cigarettes and never coming back. After several harrowing nights of blood and terror, Javier fled north, far north, all the way into Scandinavia. In the frozen wastes, he communed with his beast and learned to embrace his predatory nature. Javier's greatest joy was to test himself against the powerful, man, beast, or even rare cryptids, all of whom fell beneath Javier's claws and fangs. For over a century, Javier hunted the bergs and ridges before some instinct drew him south where he indulged in a new thrill, the deadly hunt for lupine pelts in the black forests of Germany. 
So prolific were Javier's hunts that the Lupines coined the unimaginative title of Kills Our Brothers for him. In the Rhineland, he encountered others of his kind for the first time. The Rhineland was part of the Holy Roman Empire and therefore part of the fiefdom of the Black Cross, part of the domain of Hardestat of Clan Ventru, one of the founding fathers of the Camarilla. The kindred welcomed the wild Javier into their salons and elysiums and endeavored to instruct him in the history that he had missed, the discovery of the Americas, vampire lore, and the necessity of the traditions. When his blood again stirred, Javier disappeared into Eastern Europe and then the Balkans. His activities for the next two centuries are the subject of many wild rumors that he will neither confirm nor deny. In the 18th century, he reappeared in Africa, boarding a ship for Boston, site of the first conclave of the Camarilla to be held in America. There, Javier presented the inner circle with the trophy of his greatest hunt, the head of the former gangrel Justicar, Elijah, who had succumbed to his beast and disappeared into the African interior. After a hurried discussion, the inner circle granted Javier provisional status as an archon. Seven years later, at the convocation in Venice, the inner circle elected Javier to Elijah's seat as Justicar for Clan Gangrel. Since then, Javier has made his haven in New Orleans to the consternation of that city's prince and is surprisingly skilled not only at adapting to modernity, but wields socio-political power in a way that would make Ventru and Toreador envious. Javier's 300-year career as Justicar earned him his fair share of critics along the way, some out of genuine concern for his tactics and others out of envy for his results, but he did deliver results. But, in either 1998 or 1999, things get a little confused. In one version of events, Javier destroys the Bruja Anarch, Smiling Jack, which would be a little embarrassing for him considering that Jack was tripping around Los Angeles in 2004, where he allegedly participated in the downfall of Prince Sebastian LaCroix. Anyway, Javier, without explanation, resigns as Justicar and disappears from the Camarilla, along with the majority of Clan Gangrel. Another version is that Javier led a group of Archons against the Toreador Leopold, who was possessed by the artifact called the Eye of Hazamel. Most of Javier's coterie was wiped out, but he escaped, believing, incorrectly, that he had just survived a meeting with an antediluvian. When he told his story to the convocation, the inner circle dismissed his concerns out of hand, reminding him that the antediluvians are a myth. Javier, outraged, resigned as Justicar and declared that the gangrel were no longer part of the Camarilla. Now much blood and ink has been spilled among mortals over the topic of secession and I won't add to it here. Following Javier's resignation, he became obsessed with tracking down and slaying the antediluvians, some of whom he suspected were awake and active. He managed to gather a small army of Gangrel to his cause, who he soon led to their deaths as they laid siege to a group of demon-worshipping vampires. Javier's body was devoured by hellish balefire. Number 5. Art Morgan now we go from the former Justicar of Clan Gangrel to his brother in blood, Art Morgan. First off, Art Morgan is probably an adopted name of this elder Gangrel who, by his own admission, was embraced by Rune of Tintagel in 550 AD, about 800 years before Rune got the urge to sire again. The Gangrel Art Morgan is curiously dodgy about his past, though he claims in life he was taught to respect authority and seek justice. Regardless, Art Morgan knows that the real jihad is the friends you made along the way, and he has a wide and diverse selection of friends. Morgan freely moves in the Elysiums of the Camarilla, and the Rants of the Anarchs, and the Revels of the Sabbat. In fact, prior to Javier's little tantrum, there was a faction of Gangrel actively lobbying for Morgan to replace Javier as Justicar for the clan. But Art's friends list doesn't end there. He is the only vampire known to be a welcome guest among the lupine tribe called Bone Nars at their Sept of the Awakening in Haynes Point, Washington, D.C. Finally, Morgan has several mages from both the traditions and the technocracy who count him as a friend, even knowing his true nature. So how did Art Morgan get all of these friends? Well, despite his enigmatic past, one clue is that Morgan carries himself as someone who visited the 1960s and liked it so much that he never went home again. 
Morgan behaves like someone who follows the Grateful Dead and Fish on tour. He is incredibly mellow. Nothing bothers him. He respects everyone and he listens. Another clue is that Morgan speaks of Dr. Timothy Leary in glowing terms. Now Leary was a famous psychiatrist in the 1960s for his experiments with LSD and psilocybin, which got him fired from Harvard in 1963. Leary was also famous for his participation in New Left Counterculture, coining several of its big time slogans including, think for yourself and question authority, as well as turn on, tune in, and drop out. It makes me curious as to exactly how LSD tainted blood would affect a vampire's psyche, especially if it would send a vampire on a trip in the same way as it would a mortal. Nevertheless, Art Morgan, when he isn't expanding his consciousness or plotting to be a Justicar, earns his living as a reporter for a tabloid magazine in Washington, D.C. called The Deviant. You see cheap rags like it in every mid-sized to large city. It covers those hard-hitting stories like interviews with the local crystal healers, ritual skin grafts, and the perils of grass seed, along with a helping of various and suspicious ads in the back for massages. But Morgan is a star at the Deviant, and they give him free reign to go where he wants and spend money so long as he comes back with a good story. As far as Art Morgan's beast marks, Morgan's body is covered in a thick mat of fur and facial whiskers, which he takes care to keep trimmed so as not to shock the squares, man. Harder to conceal are his yellow, wolfish eyes, which he covers with a pair of glasses. Despite his high humanity, few mortals, vampires, werewolves, or mages realize just how insane Art Morgan really is beneath the surface. Number 4. Jalun Ajav. And now we move on from the thoroughly urbane gangrel to the utterly savage. Jalun Ajav, third seraph of the Black Hand. In life, Jalun Ajav was a warrior of Temujin, known to history as Genghis Khan. Jalun Ajav rode with the Mongols as they conquered the dynasties of 13th century China, the Jia, the Jin, the Liao, and then west into Khwarazmia and Samarkand. When the Great Khan split his army in two, Jalan Ajav went north into Russia with Subutai Khan, while the Great Khan went south into Afghanistan. Subutai sent Jalan Ajav and a group of his men to scout a secluded grotto for treasure he believed that the Russian peasants were hiding from them. The peasants begged the Mongols to not go inside, claiming that it was a den of monsters. Jalan Ajav arrogantly accepted this as a challenge, but as he and his scouts journeyed deep into the grotto, they were attacked by the dark beast who cut up their horses from underneath them and extinguished their torches. The beast picked off the terrified Mongols one by one, but Jalan Ajav was the only one who remained calm. He grappled with one of the beasts and paralyzed it by driving a wooden arrow through its chest. Jalan Ajav fought his way to the mouth of the grotto, but was overwhelmed and dragged back inside. And in those desolate wastes of Russia, Jalan Ajav's life ended and he was reborn as a vampire of Clan Gangrel. Now according to him, he continued to serve Genghis Khan faithfully until the Great Khan's death, then carried off his master's corpse to rest in a hidden place in the Khaldun Mountains. Jalan Ajav spent the next two centuries wandering the world, presumably swimming along the currents of war and chaos like a shark. An unconfirmed source places Jalan Ajav among the forces of the Turkish Sultan Mehmed II as that force finally brought down the Byzantine Empire in 1453. At the dawn of the 15th century, Jalan Ajav's wanderings brought him to a Romanian village called Lugaj, where he met another of his kind for the first time in centuries. In keeping with his host's custom of hospitality, the Zamitsi Voivod, also named Lugaj, welcomed the Mongolian warrior to his domain and told him the history of the children of Cain, with particular attention paid to the founders of the 13 great clans, the Antediluvians. Jalan Ajab was intrigued and Lugaj invited him to partake of the forbidden fruit of Cainites, the Amaranth, the Diablery, the act of feasting on the blood and souls of other kindred. On Kupala's Eve, in the presence of the Anarchs who had formed the core of the dreaded Black Hand, and in the presence of the blood-red fire flower, Jalan Ajav swore his allegiance to the nascent Sabat. Since his fateful meeting with Lugaj the Bloodbreaker, Jalan Ajav's soul is permanently marked with the stains of Diablery and the souls of the vampires he has consumed. He rose quickly from assassin to dominion 
and finally to Seraph. Taciturn, irreverent, and quick to anger, Jean Lejave is feared by his allies, and few enemies ever get the opportunity to bear him any grudge at all, given that they almost never survive his lightning-fast, brutal style of attack. As in life, he prizes mobility and surprise. In modern nights, Jal Najav is the only remaining functional seraph of the Black Hand. With the death of Juha and the disappearance of Izim Erbal and the crippling madness of Elimelech, he has converted the city of Juarez, Mexico into his personal haven with a network of safe houses and tunnels, the extent of which is only known to him. This makes Jal Najav also called Ajav Khan by his immediate subordinates, the second most powerful Knight in the Sabbat after the Regent. Number three, Karsh. The Camarilla has more or less successfully chased the Sabbat from Europe, due in part to the power of the Justicars and Archons that serve the Inner Circle. However, the Inner Circle has another tool with which to enforce its will, and that tool is the Gangrel known as Karsh. He is the first, and only vampire, to hold the title Warlord of the Camarilla, and is a monster feared even by other monsters. Now Karsh's past is contradictory, as there are certain impossibilities as the story has been relayed by various people. One version places him in the Janissary Corps of the Ottoman Sultan Murad IV, pressed into service as a child when his tribe of Turkic nomads was destroyed by the Ottomans. He subsequently rose to be a captain, and sided with Murad when his Janissary brothers attempted to depose the Sultan in a coup. Following the failure of the coup, the remaining treacherous Janissaries decided to frame Karsh, then known as Hassan el Samir, for the murder of three Persian diplomats. Murad IV condemned Hassan to be torn apart by a single wolf. When Hassan killed the beast with his bare hands, the Sultan decided to send a pack of wolves to execute him. These wolves were also beaten to death by the massive Hassan. Finally, Murad tasked his vizier to find wolves savage enough to destroy him. On the advice of a strange wise man, the vizier ordered Hassan to be chained up in a distant wasteland said to be haunted by evil wolf spirits and waited to see Hassan's death. That night was black as pitch, but the vizier and his men heard wolves howling in the distance and screaming. When the noise died, they found Hassan. His body was slashed thousands of times and completely drained of blood. The vizier, a devout Muslim and respectful of Hassan, but obedient to his sultan, ordered Hassan to be buried as befit a fellow Muslim. Hassan dug himself free of his grave that same night and raced back to the palace. Maddened by starvation and vengeance, Hassan tore through the Janissaries to slake his thirst before twisting Murad IV's head from his neck. Hassan then presented the crowned head to the obviously terrified vizier and told him that the evil wolf spirit had come to him and offered him immortality in exchange for eternal service. Hassan had died, as the Sultan had wished, but from his grave had risen Karsh, the Avenger. The wolf spirit had been a Gangrel Methuselah, one who was loyal to the Camarilla, and had selected Karsh to be that sect's warlord, masquerading as a sage who advised the vizier in the market. The Gangrel Methuselah gave Karsh a generation to settle his affairs in the Ottoman Empire before he returned to take Karsh to his destiny. In that time, Karsh and the Vizier collaborated to secure and rebuild the Ottoman Empire. As the Methuselah promised, he returned and carried Karsh off to Europe. Another version places Karsh, still as Hassan el Samir, at the Battle of Manzikert in 1054 AD as a mortal in the armies of the Seljuk Turks during its war against the Byzantine Empire, nearly 600 years before the reign of Sultan Murad IV. A third version is that he served two sultans, the second being named Murad, who also betrayed him and exiled him. The first sultan named Murad was Murad I, who reigned for most of the 14th century and created the Janissary Corps, 300 years after the Battle of Manzikert and 300 before the reign of Murad IV. Noticing a problem yet? At the end of the 15th century, presumably after the founding of the, of the Camarilla, Hassan met the Ventru Lord and one of the founders of the Camarilla, Hardestat. Whatever passed between the black monarch of the Ventru and Hassan el Samir must have made an impression on the Gangrel, because Hassan pledged his fealty to Hardestat and the Camarilla, swearing to serve as the Janissary of the immortal 
king and eternal Camarilla as he had for the Ottoman Sultan. He even went so far as to adopt a new name to go with his new office. From then on, Hassan El Samir would be known as Karsh, the warlord of the Camarilla. And Karsh has lived up to his title as warlord. Camarilla and Sabat tend to pay more attention to his personal battle prowess. He has rarely needed more than one swing of his blade to deliver final death to a vampire, and he passes through blade, bludgeon, bomb, and bullet like an ordinary man walks through a gentle breeze. As adept as Karsh is at close range combat with his sword, it's not his only weapon. As befits a true warlord, he has an army at his command, a group of strike teams deployed from his fortress nestled in a secluded mountain range in the United States. Karsh also has an encyclopedic knowledge of the weapons and methodologies of ancient and modern warfare. He can identify and counter cavalry charges just as easily as he can small unit urban warfare. Several Sabat cities have fallen to Karsh without the warlord ever taking the field, his enemies falling prey to convenient and timely accidents, or political, legal, or financial mishaps that left his enemies weakened for a final blow. But what is the truth of Karsh? Where did he really come from? The 11th century? The 13th century? The 17th century? Now, we can get into the really fun stuff. For your consideration, I present on screen a side-by-side -side comparison of the stat blocks of Jalan Ajav and Karsh. With the exceptions of demeanor, supposed time of embrace, backgrounds, and alone derangement, their stats are identical. Now that's an awfully big coincidence. Two fifth generation Gangrel, both highly placed in their respective sects, both nearly invincible in battle, with nearly the same attributes, skills, resources, and morality. It's almost as if, as if, they are the same person. Now, the Karsh Jalan Ajab connection has been kicked around since ye olden days of White Wolf, and I'm not going to break any fresh ground on it. Only describe the popular theories. First, the White Wolf editors just got really lazy and copied the same stats across two characters and made a little adjustment. This is entirely possible. Boring as hell, but possible. Writers and editors have been known to make mistakes from time to time. The second theory is that they are really two different Gangrel who just happen to develop along nearly the same lines. Again, possible, but also boring as hell. The third theory is that Karsh and Jalan Ajab are the same Gangrel, playing both sides of the Jihad for their own ends. This is the one I like most because it is most in keeping with the overall themes of Vampire. Ancient bloodsuckers manipulating mortals and one another on the scale of decades and centuries, culminating in the complete destruction of their enemies. And what could be more artful, what could be a more masterful coup than a single Gangrel commanding the deadliest forces on both sides of the Jihad who can close the curtain on the whole damn thing with one word? Now the fourth and final and strangest theory is that Karsh and Jalan Ajav were once the same Gangrel, a fourth generation Methuselah who used a ninth level protean discipline called dual form to split itself into two new vampires one generation higher which first appeared in the first edition player's guide. This is possible. It's kind of interesting. It's like the Theory 2 and Theory 3 put together with just a little twist in it. The dual form power essentially creates two separate characters one generation higher with one less attribute in each stat who are intuitively linked but may act independently of one another. Most importantly, they can reform on touch. Whew, this is heavy duty. But whatever the truth, Jalan Ajav and Karsh control the majority of the military forces in the Jihad and should they decide to use those forces for something other than to do their master's bidding, may Cain have mercy on all of his children. Number two, Beckett. Okay, so let's shift gears back from Gangrel head choppers and gunslingers to Gangrel scholars. Yes, such a thing does in fact exist, like the Gangrel known as Beckett. For a vampire so obsessed with discovering the truth of history, his own history is certainly opaque. For starters, his name, Beckett. Like Art Morgan, it's probably not his real name, 
and by his own admission, it is simply the moniker he has adopted for use in the modern age. And second, his age. Beckett claims to be around 300 years old, just enough to put him on the younger end of vampire elders. Yet his attitude is much more in line with an older vampire, one who likely predates the Camarilla and the Sabbat, because he has little interest in either one. Beckett's mission, his obsession, is to discover the secrets of vampire history, of Cain, the Antediluvians, and the First City. He is a nodist, though he does not worship Cain as a god, or even as a dark father as most nodists do. In fact, Beckett is disinclined to believe that Cain actually existed at all. Like most Gangrel, Beckett was abandoned by his sire, or so he says. His proper introduction to the ways of the damned came from a Malkavian named Aristotle de Laurent, an esteemed Nodist scholar and one of the Nemocene, a Nodist cult dedicated to researching and compiling the entire history of vampires. Aristotle de Laurent adopted Beckett, inducted him into the Nemocene, and sent him on his merry way. Beckett made a bit of a stir among Nodists when Aristotle permitted him to contribute to his 1992 translation of the Book of Nod. Beckett asserted that Cain and Abel were merely allegorical myths, a parable to represent the transition of humanity from tribal hunter-gatherers to sedentary agrarians and the violence that often resulted from conflicts between the tribes and the farmers. Aristotle humors Beckett in his pursuits on this point. Beckett is known for appearing when some piece of ancient vampire history or interesting artifact has been unearthed, as he did in Los Angeles in 2004 when the Ankaran sarcophagus turned up in that city. His preferred method of travel is in the form of a wolf using the protean discipline. When confronted with traveling overseas, he boards his very private and very sunproof jet, piloted by his ghoul Cesare. He earns money by selling those artifacts that are of no interest to him. During his long search for truth, he has made both allies and enemies. His allies include his ghoul, obviously, Cesare, the Malkavian prophet, Anatole, the rogue La Sombra, Lucida de Aragorn, the thin-blooded Nosferatu antiquarian, Oculos, the mage, Nola Spear, and the, um, well, rather unusual vampire of unknown age and clan calling himself Capanius. Beckett's enemies, though, hoo boy, Beckett's enemies are rather numerous and powerful. Let's start with his most invested enemy, the Zamitsi Sasha Vikos, a fellow Nodist and competitor for vampire artifacts and lore. The competition has become so serious that Vikos has tortured and murdered several of Beckett's allies just to get to him. The Sabbat certainly do play hard and fast to win. From the Sabbat to the Camarilla, where Beckett has drawn the ire of the master of the Camarilla, Hardestat, though the Ventru was a greater fault than Beckett in that misunderstanding. During a meeting between the two, Hardestat used his potent dominate discipline to compel Beckett to answer him honestly. Beckett, unwisely, revealed that he knew that Hardestat was masquerading as his own sire, killed by the Brujat Patricia Bolingbroke. Hardestat, not wanting that embarrassing fact to get out into the world, sent Archon Theobel to kill Beckett, which he didn't succeed at doing. Lastly, Beckett has made an enemy of the followers of Set thanks to his rescue of Lady Emma Blake, a Tremere who the Setites planned to sacrifice to one of their Methuselahs. Now, as mentioned before, Beckett was present in Los Angeles during the events surrounding the Ankaran sarcophagus and Sebastian LaCroix. Initially, Beckett was eager to open the sarcophagus as LaCroix was, though for some strange reason, Beckett fled the city before the sarcophagus was destroyed along with LaCroix and his entire haven. Such are the hazards when one seeks the truth. Number one, Dr. Alan T. Woodstock. In the early 20th century, Alan Woodstock was breezing through the ranks of researchers at Cambridge, his future bright and his place in the hallowed halls of academic science all but guaranteed. But like much of the flower of English manhood, he found himself drafted into what was supposed to be the war to end all wars, the Great War, the big one. Given his bona fides, Woodstock was sped through officer training and into a lab to study new and exciting ways to kill other young men rounded up to die for their leader's vanity. Woodstock believed that if he did his work well, he would quickly return home to his new wife and young daughter. 
The British tested Woodstock's weapons on dozens of animals, anything with a cardiovascular system, rats, rabbits, cats, dogs, anything that they could expose and observe as it died gasping for clean air. Woodstock's commander wasn't satisfied with the results and wanted to test on human subjects, the fatally injured and prisoners of war. A shame that the Major never heard or wasn't acquainted with the Hague Convention. Anyway, the Major responded to Woodstock's protest against the testing of chemical weapons on human beings with about as much grace as you might expect from someone who would even make such a suggestion in the first place. He busted Woodstock down to Sergeant and shipped him off to the front lines. And the lesson today is that if you want to succeed in any hierarchical organization, embrace a sociopathic disregard for human life. According to Woodstock, he died in the sixth month of the longest battle of World War I, the Battle of Verdun in 1916, though this is a bit suspicious as the English did not have infantry deployed during that battle. Supposedly he was injured on the battlefield and dying in the mud. As night fell, there was a scavenger on the battlefield. Woodstock, since his embrace, doesn't know if his sire saw something in him worth preserving or if his sire was just a sloppy feeder and accidentally dropped blood into his mouth. Whatever the intent, he awoke as a vampire of Clan Gangrel and mustered just enough strength to dig himself into the mud before the sun rose. Woodstock remained in torpor until the end of the war. When he reemerged, the Entente had won, Germany was defeated, and Turkey was on the butcher's block, and his life, as he knew it, was gone. His wife had learned of his death and remarried, and his daughter was too young to remember him. Dr. Woodstock thought this was for the best and sought solace in the only thing he knew how to do, science. An English pharmaceutical company was willing to give a brilliant but shell-shocked young veteran night shifts in their lab. Eventually he came to the attention of London's prince, Lady Anne Bosley of Clan Ventrue. Initially she believed that Dr. Woodstock was still human, and sent envoys to feel him out as a possible candidate for the embrace. When she discovered that he was already a child of Cain, she invited him to her salons and made introductions for him to the kindred of London. This sponsorship, naturally, came with a price. Dr. Woodstock would investigate certain subjects of interest to Queen Anne. When Europe decided that they wanted a do-over of World War I and started a second world war, Dr. Woodstock took the opportunity to leave for Greenland where he heard that many of his clan, the Gangrel, resided. There he learned the ways and traditions of the Gangrel that had been handed down since the time of Odin, the All High. Dr. Woodstock maintains a permanent haven in London, but spends most of his time in his mobile laboratory, enabling him to go where the specimens are. His current primary research topic is the disciplines of vampires. Dr. Woodstock would like to reduce the mystical principles and executions of disciplines to mathematical and scientific theories. Thus far, he has not met with the results he would like. With each subject he studies, he discovers certain subtleties, variants in how vampires manifest and use their disciplines, though raw data and cataloging of disciplines have made him a welcome guest lecturer in many Camarilla Elysiums. He knows that he and the Malkavian, Dr. Douglas Nickchurch, have the same interest in vampire physiology and hematology, though he admits Dr. Nickchurch's work is closer to completion than his own. And that was it, the top ten members of Clan Gangrel. Despite some contrary perceptions, the Gangrel can function in society just fine. It's just that if they have to choose between fitting in, going along with the program, or following their own instincts, they'll almost always go with their, well, bestial instincts. And almost all Gangrel are afflicted with some kind of wanderlust, whether it's as a hitchhiker, a mobile researcher, or a jet-setting archaeologist. So the next one up on the to-do list is the Clan of Death and Incest. Next up, the top ten vampires of Clan Giovanni. See you next time.